This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. We can look now at the various models and approaches to strategic planning, at least an overview. And this is a model called the rational model. This is the one which is most important for the exam because this is the sort of planning process that most of the large questions in the exam are likely to be based. And it's called rational because it is essentially, first of all, you sit back and you collect information, you analyze that information, and you make as rational or as logical a decision you can possibly make about what to do in the future. That's your strategic choice. Then you implement it. Uh, and what you have to do then is to make sure you control what's happening. Uh, first of all, to make sure that you are on track for hitting the plan, but also uh, to make sure that the plan doesn't need to be changed. Again, it's important to realize that a strategic plan, remember it's lasting five, ten years, it will change. No strategic plan is ever going to be written now and it's still going to be relevant in all its detail in, in five years. The world changes. Competitors surprise you. You have to react. You have to change the plan. Anyway, if we look first of all at the, uh, the uh, uh, the first element in in here, which is the position analysis. Uh, this is uh, looking at uh, what's happening externally. And we'll see how to do that in various different ways later. But basically, uh, you, for example, should take into account what the economy is doing. Uh, if the economy seems to be booming, then maybe your strategy is to open another factory or try to uh, open up abroad if the economy is booming there as well. Uh, if the economy is going down, then the strategy might be to try and sell off, to perhaps to try to lose capacity and, and so on. But th th there are many external things that we'll look at in detail, but you have to take them into account. We can also look internally. This is uh, essentially saying, uh, what are we good at? What can we do? Uh, there is no point, uh, for example, in trying to open up, uh, let's say, uh, a new operation in Brazil, if you have absolutely no uh, international trading experience whatsoever. You go into this country that you know nothing about, uh, and the chances are you're going to fall flat in your face. There's no point saying my strategy is to take over a company if you've got no money. Uh, there's no point in saying I'm going to launch a new product, uh, again, if you don't own the patents, or again, if you don't have money to develop those uh, new products. You are constrained very often uh, by what you are capable of doing. We have to take into account the stakeholders. We'll see stakeholders are really anyone with a an interest in, in the business. Uh, it could be, for example, shareholders. Uh, and you have to take into account what shareholders want. A company has been run by directors on behalf of the shareholders. And uh, you might have two strategies. Uh, one is high risk, high return. One is low risk, low return. And you have to think, what would my shareholders want? They're, they're stakeholders. Or the organisation might be a hospital because you're not always given profit-seeking organisations in this exam and their major st uh, stakeholders are going to be patients. Uh, and you have to think, well, what would patients want? Uh, do we you know, provide uh, an extra MRI scanning machine or do we provide uh, a, a, an extra operating theatre? Money is going to be limited and rationed in some way and we have to take into account what uh, customers, shareholders, um, uh, um, patients uh, actually want. That's of course, sometimes of course, employees. And then there is uh, the mission. Uh, we'll see the mission kind of sets out what the purpose of the organization is. Uh, people who are dealing with the organization have got some expectations that the organization will roughly follow its mission. And we just have to think carefully if we go off on a radical strategy, which is changing that mission. Uh, we have to think, do we have the knowledge or the know-how to allow us to carry on a, rational, uh, a radically different uh, strategy? What will this do to our stakeholders' expectations? 
Once we've assessed both inside and outside, then we have a, a, an idea of maybe what objectives we could uh, manage. In a profit-seeking organisation, the objectives might be profits, share price, earnings per share, dividends. But you can't set objectives before you have assessed the uh, information, the position. Essentially, the position uh, phase here at the start is information gathering. You may have uh, several different options. So, for example, if you wanted to increase profits, maybe what you do is you open in France, or maybe what you do is you take over another company in your own country, uh, and you have to think, well, which of these various options which I could do and could afford, uh, uh, which ones should I choose? Uh, should I get into perhaps a joint venture with a company rather than setting up my own operations abroad? So we've got a range of options which might fulfill our objectives. Uh, and then we have to come to the hard bit, really. This is where almost the risky bit begins. We have to come down and make a choice and say, right, this is what we're, this is what we're doing over the next five to ten years. And then, knowing what you're doing, you can begin the implementation. Uh, and as I uh, suggest, this uh, uh, feedback here is very, very important here. Are we still on track? Uh, uh, are we going to hit the plan? And secondly, is the plan still relevant? Or has something dreadful happened, uh, perhaps in the economy, like the banking crisis, that really means we have to go back to the drawing board and perhaps think of a new strategy. This uh, diagram is simply there to indicate that this, uh, uh, the previous diagram, where it went, you know, position, choice, implementation, that kind of one, two, three, is probably not quite as linear as that. Uh, think of yourself as planning a holiday with some friends. You and your friends get together, uh, you assess the costs of the holiday, you assess when you can get holiday time off work uh, and so on, uh, and you uh, have got various choices. So you look at the internet and the, the prices of flights and so on here, and based on your gathering of information, kind of go down here and you make a choice. So you say, I'm going to be going on holidays the last two week of August, uh, perhaps to Italy or, or, or wherever. So everyone's happy that they're going to be doing that. And then you go back and you try booking your flight or booking the hotel. And you find that the flight is full or the prices have gone up. Or maybe what happens, uh, one of your uh, friends rings the next day and says, I got my holiday time wrong, it's in the wrong week, can't be moved. Uh, because once you begin trying to implement strategies, once you begin trying to do things, you inevitably find out far more information about them, usually difficulties about them that have been underestimated. Uh, what you have to do then is, is to kind of go around and, and do a little bit of a planning exercise again. So rather than planning being thought of as a linear one, two, three, think of it as a kind of a, a bit of an iterative uh, process. It's never ending. It's never frozen. It can never be frozen because things keep changing. Now this uh, diagram uh, uh, really illustrates that point again. Really the only term you need to, to remember in it, I think, the one that keeps coming up is something called an emergence strategy. But this is simply saying that what we had uh, was our big plan at the start. This is our intended strategy. And then as time passes and we find out more about uh, what implementing the strategy might entail, some bits of it drop out. So the unrealized parts of the strategy fall by the wayside, too difficult, too expensive, not appropriate, whatever. We continue on with the kind of residue of the intended strategy. But as time passes, new ideas must emerge, new opportunities. Think over again five to ten years. Lots of new ideas must emerge. Or perhaps when we uh, begin implementing our strategy, we see this part works really well, this part doesn't work quite so well, so let's jettison that part and let's concentrate on just this part of the strategy. So your vision really matures as you go through and you end up with a, a realised strategy, which is a kind of mixture of things we always intended to do, and less the things we've abandoned, plus new ideas that came along. And this is quite important because it does illustrate the importance of 
flexibility in strategic planning. We'll see later the wrong way to plan is to say, this is my plan, I will do this plan, come what may. You have to stay open to other things which are going to be available. Some people don't uh, believe that the big, grand, rational planning approach is actually sensible. They say, how can you sit here and plan for the next five years or the next ten years? You're wasting your time, is, is kind of what they're, they're, they're saying. And, and the, the, the main point, the easiest point really to, to get hold of here is what's called bounded rationality. These people would say, look, you don't know what your competitors are planning. You don't know what products they are planning to launch. How can you therefore plan for five years? You don't know what the economy is going to do. Even more than that, there are kind of random events which happened in the world. Uh, some years ago, we had a tsunami off Japan. It inundated a nuclear power station at Fukushima. And at that time, Germany was planning to build many nuclear power stations and many of their engineering companies were, were, were kind of gearing up to, to provide the machinery. And suddenly, Germany said, nuclear power is too dangerous, we don't want it. So out of the blue, you had a random event, which uh, really put those engineering companies, all of their plans went askew because of this unknown unknown, as it's called. So these people say that instead of making this grand leap forward of five or ten years, what you do is plan a more gradually incremental approach. And they would say the following, really. They would kind of say, look, here's the economy, OK? We know the economy goes through cycles, boom, bust, boom, bust, uh, to, to some extent, the world economy and so on. And let's say here we are around 2008. And in 2008, you may not remember, but we'd had a, uh, a recent history of very good economies, lots and lots of growth and so on. And let's say you are a house builder or building apartments and you're down here, right? Remember, you, do, you, don't, you don't see you don't see the uh, the, the the bits uh, across here at all. This this is all invisible to you uh, over over here. All you see is the past that the economy has been doing well, and you, the predictions are that the economy is going to be doing well in the future. So you buy lots of land and you start lots of apartment blocks, and you're kind of locked into that. You're going to be building more and more apartments because. The price of property always goes up. I can never remember it going down. I'll build more and more apartments and we'll all make a fortune. And you embark on this strategy of a building heading towards an economy which is kind of up there somewhere. And then, of course, uh, we had the banking crisis and the bottom dropped out of the market. But you are locked into building. You've bought the land. You've started your buildings. You can't easily reverse. So you've overshot, really. And then you get cold feet. You say, oh dear, I must get out of this, must get out of it. The economy is going to be down in the doldrums for, for ages. And you kind of, again, overreact again, you're down there. And then maybe when the economy starts coming up again, you're, you're, you're too slow. So this kind of lurching about the place is caused really by this bounded rationality. You overcommit. What's the incrementalists would say is don't look five years ahead uh, look a little bit there and then see what the economy is doing make a little gradual ad adjustments little gradual extensions to past policies and this means you'll never go too far wrong you can't always do that uh, kodak couldn't have made little incremental changes to its products it was kind of films on nothing uh, but there is something to be said, maybe, for at least being modest and humble uh, in knowing that you have done the best long-term plan you can, uh, but there's a lot of guesswork within it. So logical incrementalists would say, don't waste time trying to do your five or ten year plan. Do them one or two years at a time uh, and, and, and don't gamble too much on what's going to come up. Finally, we have uh, what are called freewheeling opportunists. And essentially, uh, this is almost a psychological trait. These people don't like planning. And, and you, know, you will have friends, some of whom 
like to know exactly what's happening uh, and some of whom are, shall we say, more happy-go-lucky, more flexible. Uh, these people are, are people who, who are kind of psychologically not suited to a lot of detail and a lot of planning. They like to grab opportunities as they come along. Uh, and they say, if you plan, then automatically you are restricting your vision and you will miss these opportunities as they come along. They would rather not plan and grab good opportunities that they see. These people are often regarded as entrepreneurs and of course some entrepreneurs are very successful. They seem to start business after business after business. They're often radically different. Uh, what you don't see are the very many unsuccessful entrepreneurs who quickly rush into a new business, a new venture without perhaps enough homework, without enough planning and find that it fails. And of course you tend not to hear of failed entrepreneurs. The one thing in these people's uh, favour is it can be really very quick. Uh, we'll see uh, later that sometimes if you have a very rational planning approach where it has to go through lots of committees to get approval and so on, it can be very, very slow to react to change of circumstances. These people are at least quick, although they could be quick to decide on the wrong strategy. Finally, in this chapter, just a, a brief mention of what's called strategic lenses, almost three meanings of the word uh, strategy. First of all, we think of strategy as ideas. This is the, the kind of blue sky thinking for the future. Where are we going to be in five to ten years? What sort of products are we going to be selling? And, and so on. And then we have a strategy as experience. We know a lot about the, the market. Uh, that we have been dealing with, the products that we've been dealing with so far. So strategy as experience is uh, knowing what we're good at. Strategy as ideas is knowing what we need to be good at in the future. I think of strategy as design, as the careful way in which you must change from one strategy to another. You don't want to change maybe in a way which is going to upset your stakeholders, for example, upsetting your customers. You have to carry them with you. You have to plan gradually the implementation of the new strategy so that you don't fail, you don't kind of fall between them in, in, in some way. Uh, and this is where strategy as design is important. <laughs>